going back to Abilara in County Longford, and uh, I gather that there have been developments. Niall, uh, are you there? What can you tell us? So it's been a tragic, sudden and shocking end to this siege. The man who we know to be 27-year-old John Carthy is dead. This is a story that began on the 19th of April 2000 in a small village called Abilara in County Longford. The result of what would happen in the next 25 hours would bring national attention to this small village. Three investigations, one tribunal over six years at the cost of 20 million euro to the taxpayer. It would bring debate among the public and authorities over how the Gardaí and the ERU, which is the Emergency Response Unit, handle the situation and how this could have been prevented if information had been passed on to the relevant authorities who are on the scene. Also, it would come into question the role of the media and how information that was released escalated the situation which led to the death of John Carthy. John was the son of a Bordnemona worker. Bordnemona is an Irish-run company that basically produced sod peat. The peat would then be used to generate electricity, manufacture peat briquettes and supply the horticulture industry. John spent most of his life in Abilara, living with his father, mother and sister until his father passed away. John was quiet and never involved with the Gardaí in his youth. His sister and himself were very close, even starting school the same day and sitting together in class. John was the eldest of the two by a year and a half. When he left school, he went to horticulture college and this is when he would first start suffering from depression. John was very aware and got help and kept it under control. He suffered from bipolar, which in turn, there's a lack of control over emotions and behavior. He was involved in sport and an avid handball player. He liked to drink and he was a bit of a chain smoker. In 1998, the Abbey Lara football team won the Senior County Football Championship and there was great celebrations. The parish had a mascot, a fiberglass goat, erected. The day after the celebrations, the mascot was set alight. A local publican told the Gardaí that two youths had told him that John Carthy had done it. The Gardaí called John in about the incident. He went to see them no problem as he thought it was about getting his gun back as it had been confiscated due to his illness and he felt duped by the Gardaí and when he asked for his gun back they said no which had annoyed John. He asked his psychologist to write a letter so he could get his gun back. The psychologist was surprised that he was allowed a gun considering his mental problems. So John went to another psychologist and got a letter. The guard he accused John of burning down the mascot and he strongly denied it. When John wouldn't admit to it, Gardy decided to rough him up a bit and try and get a confession. This made John look at the Gardy in a new light and his trust of them was totally gone after this incident. Living in a small village, everyone knows everyone on a personal level and this would include the Gardy stationed there. You would even socialise with them so the Gardy would have been aware of John and that he was harmless and also he was 25 years of age, never in trouble, he was hardly going to start now. Later on that year, the Gardaí returned his gun and issued his licence when John was feeling better. All was good then until Wednesday the 19th of April 2000, the day before Holy Thursday. John and his mother were at home together when John became agitated and he went out to the back garden and fired two shots into the air and he told his mother to leave. Seemingly, they were both supposed to move into the new house next door the next day that had been built, but John didn't want to, and the old house was to be demolished, which John wasn't happy about. He also just broke up with his girlfriend. His mother left and went to her sister's house two doors down and rang the guardy to come help with John and to get his gun. This had been done previously with no incident. The first guardie arrived at around 5.55pm and because of John's fear and mistrust of the guardie, he fired shots at the unmarked guardie car to warn them away from the house. The guardie called for backup and from then on it turned into a disaster. Armed detectives, more guardie and the ERU arrived on the scene and surrounded the house. John was alone in the house. Before this escalated, the only danger he was to anyone was to himself. 
The people of the village were shocked when they saw what was happening. They thought it was an overreaction. They felt annoyed that a small domestic row in a house was now becoming a national incident. As the day was ending, the national media were descending on the small village. Marie, John's sister, arrived at around 11pm after Gardie went to collect her in Galway. Marie told the Gardie, if you just leave him alone for a while, he'll calm down and come out himself and let her talk to him. Later on that night, Gardie called Marie and John's friend Martin Shelley to the scene again. When they arrived, they said Marie was not fit to see her brother as she was drunk. Marie stated she had never been drunk in her life and she had only one hot whiskey, but the Gardaí would not let her down to the house to help John. By now John must have felt so alone, under huge stress from the way things had escalated, surrounded by people he didn't trust, no cigarettes and no solicitor coming as both requests were denied. The Gardaí said they couldn't find John's solicitor, so Marie suggested getting the family solicitor, which wasn't done. His doctor had arrived earlier in the day, but was not contacted again until late into the night, and he was not allowed to speak to John. John's psychiatrist wasn't contacted until the next day. It's always important to make small concessions in exchange for cooperation. You give them food or cigarettes, and in return, you get a small gesture of cooperation back. This was not done. The next morning, the media asked to go up near the house and the Gardaí relented and they were brought to the scene of the siege. They brought the media up the hill in Garda cars. The cameras were allowed slightly closer to the house. The family got in contact with the Gardaí to call the media off as it was going to be harmful to John. It would jeopardise the whole situation and they were told there was nothing they could do. When John saw the media, he fired a few shots and the media were moved back down the hill. John's name and personal details about his life were released and the family knew this would greatly upset John. The Gardaí had not told them not to release his name but did express their dissatisfaction. John would have heard this information over the radio. Even now if he came out everyone is going to know it was him in that house and this heightened the stakes for John. This would have greatly affected him and driven him over the edge. In the evening, John decided to emerge from the house, a loaded shotgun in hand as he approached the first command post. Detective Inspector Michael Jackson pleaded with John several times to put down the gun, but he ignored him. He said, John, it's Mick. Please drop the gun. John glanced towards Mick, but continued to walk briskly out onto the road. John then opened up his gun and removed the cartridge from the right barrel and threw it away leaving a cartridge in the left barrel and closed the gun. Immediately, John turned towards the second command post. He was marching towards them at a brisk pace in a determined and purposeful manner. Detective Inspector Michael Jackson said he believed John was going to fire. Because of this, he opened fire on John and shot him in the left thigh. But this had no effect and John continued to walk briskly with his right hand on the trigger. He fired at John once again into his other leg and still John did not go down. By now, John was on the middle of the road and heading towards the village. A shot rang out from the right of John and Detective Guard Aidan McCabe had shot John in the lower back and still John continued walking and again McCabe shot John in the back and his heart was pierced and he fell to the ground on his back with his head near the ditch on the far side of the road. After a 25 hour siege, John was dead. I could see John's legs coming out the gate. And I see the detectives running and shouting, he's out, he's out. I just seen him coming out. Just at the, around the centre of the road is the first time I seen him. And the next thing they just fired. That was it, I just seen him falling. I just seen him lying down on the road. And Did you go to him? No, I begged the guards to let me just say goodbye to him, and they wouldn't let me. Did just, they just give push, any reason? They just kept pushing me back and saying he was all right. Twenty-four hours after it first began, this standoff ended in tragedy. 
John's sister Marie and his friend were just up the road as John was walking towards them and she thinks he was walking to her for help. They both heard the shots ring out and saw him fall to his death in front of them. Marie begged to go see him to say goodbye, but they wouldn't let her. They kept pushing her back and said he's all right. Everybody was shocked and nobody had expected it to end like this. The villagers gathered together in church to pray for John who had died on Holy Thursday, the same day his father and grandfather had died previously. John Carthy's death had become a public affair, but when he was buried three days later, the media were asked to stay away. Three days after the funeral, Marie called for a public inquiry into the death of John and the FBI were called in to help with the internal investigation called the Culligan Report. But this was not good enough for the Carthy family. The FBI praised the Gardaí's response and said they should have fired sooner. The Carthy family said that it was inadequate to have a Garda investigating a Garda and that the FBI did not speak with John's family, friends, witnesses or the community. Four months after John's death, the Culligan report was still not published, despite extracts being released to the media. At the inquest, the family still called for a public inquiry to answer unresolved questions. There was a conflict of evidence with the state pathologist Dr John Harbison and members of the Gardaí and the body was moved before Dr Harbison got there. Two weeks later after the inquest, the Culligan report was published, which basically exonerated the Gardaí. The Carthy family and the public were not happy with the report. It actually increased doubts of the Gardaí's handling of John's killing. Just about every basic point was incorrect in the report. While it was a tragedy that John was killed, the report painted John out to be a gambler, a drunk and a bit of a bowsy, introverted and a poor mixer. Locals resented this. They knew John as a caring local individual who loved his sport and was well respected in the area, as were his family. His medical history was also in the Culligan report, which didn't belong there because at the time of the siege, many of the Gardaí didn't have that information which they should have had in order to handle the situation better. The DPP concluded that no prosecution should be brought against the Gardaí over their handling of the situation. The Carthy family were angered by the decision. A year after John's death, an Oireachtas committee had their own inquiry, which ended before it even began. The Oireachtas is the Parliament of the Republic of Ireland. It was ineffective from day one. It was clear the Gardaí were not happy with the process whereby one of them could have been named as responsible and one of them could have personal comments mentioned about their role in the siege. That is, it was said by one of the Gardaí to a family member, we fucked up, which was later denied. From day one, they objected about the procedures. They went to the court and stopped it in a very short period. It was concluded that the Oireachtas does not have the power to conduct this type of inquiry. The family continued to push for an independent inquiry and got the support of the people of Ireland and politicians. Eventually, the Justice Minister, John O'Donoghue, approved it. A tribunal under Justice Robert Barr was founded in April 2003, three years after John's death. Finally, hopefully, the Carty family will get the answers to what happened that day in Abbey Lara and did John need to die? It was to be over by August, but it would take a lot longer. 18 months in total. When the report was finally published in July 2006, Justice Barr heavily criticised the Gardaí and the media. Justice Barr not only looked at what went wrong on the day John died, but also brought forward changes that should be made so this never happens again. The individual Gardaí that shot John were not faulted, but there were severe criticism of the senior Gardaí who were present. Justice Barr said that two of these senior Gardaí had a role in the process which left John dead. He also criticised the Garda Síochána's structure for dealing with such incidents. Justice Barr said, I am satisfied that the responsibility for his death rests primarily with the scene commander, Superintendent Shelley and Superintendent Byrne, and to the lesser extent to the ERU tactical commander, Detective Commander Jerry Russell. He also said the greatest Garda mistake at Abbey Lara was not preparing for an exit for John from his home. It was patently negligent not to contact John's own attorney or the family solicitor when John had asked for them. 
He also criticised the media for revealing John's name and personal details. Justice Barr also tried to restore the good name of the Carthy family, John in particular. That this was very important because the aftermath of the Culligan report, their reputation was greatly damaged. It was vitally important that someone with authority should try and redress that. Justice Barr did a great job in doing this. The Gardaí were very angry with this report, including members of the ERU. They said Justice Barr didn't understand what was happening that day and how things happened so quickly. The Gardaí didn't concede to what was in the report and would not apologise to the Carthy family and admit that the whole situation was handled badly. Tony Hickey, the assistant Garda commissioner at the time, also said that Justice Barr didn't fully understand the circumstances the force were confronted with on the day. They had a man that fired up to 30 shots over a period of 25 hours and who left the house with a loaded gun. Finally, three weeks after the publication of the Barr report and six years after the killing of John, the Gardaí issued an apology to the Carthy family. Guard the practices in siege situations have since been overhauled as a result of the Barr report. Media also were given new guidelines for reporting sieges. The state paid the Carty family €100,000. Although the Barr Tribunal stops short of finding that the killing of John was unlawful, it contains a strong indictment of the Gardaí for both conduct of the so-called siege and their efforts to manipulate the public perception of the case. Erdera. Tri Hachten Tresh Alshu Hurish Bar, Agashe Blina Tresh Vosh John Carthy, Ravna Gordi Leshke Le Munter Carthy. Tomoran Ahriya Denta or Hachtish Nagordi Yagos Nilager Marhara a Hurish Bar. Totrorak Nue Gorti E. Homa a Dakalit Turish Gu Lager. Hosan Turish Bar, Fehepunka Kahar Million Euro, Ladani Fur Munter Carthy, Turmis Kayet Mila Euro, Kutuv. There were glaring intelligence failures such as Superintendent Shelley not passing on information to the ERU. That John had told his friend on the phone that he had no intention to shoot at any Gardaí. The Garda that shot John did not have this information and believed John was a threat. The Gardaí did not seek information from the family's GP about John's depression. Therefore, the ERU were not aware. John's request to see his solicitor was not granted. This left John feeling isolated and in a state of confusion. In particular, a solicitor would have been able to reassure him with regards to his fears surrounding his family home and of being arrested. While some of you may or may not feel that the Gardaí and the ERU were at fault, I think the overreactive nature of the Gardaí to bring in the ERU, knowing there was a history between John and the Gardaí, did not help the situation. The fact that John's sister was not allowed near the house, but the media were. John suffered from depression, but this information was not passed on to the ERU by the Gardaí. Gardaí did not grant any of John's requests, not even cigarettes. John was a chain smoker. When John walked out of the house, they let him pass the first command post. And while he was carrying a gun and didn't put it down, he did not aim it at anyone. He was heading towards the next command post when they opened fire and shot him from behind. There was no exit strategy for John and he lost his life because of this. I have been in a similar situation myself and I can tell you the ERU and Gardaí have learned their lessons. This person this happened to that I know was in a mentally stressed state as John was and because the ERU handled it properly the gun was retrieved. I was allowed back into the house to help calm the situation and I was allowed to take him to the mental hospital safely and to get the help he needed and no charges were brought against him. I remember him saying to the ERU officer, I hope you did this quietly as I don't want people to know and the officer reassured him that no one knew. We lived in a housing estate and the whole section of the housing estate was cordoned off with about 30 ERU officers surrounding our house and people from other houses on the far side watching. But before we left and in order to get him out safely, they cleared the area. Everyone was told to go back into their houses and all the vans and guard cars left, except one, and we drove out and he was none the wiser. This was so important and I cannot praise the Gardaí and the ERU enough for how they handled the situation. 
While you might think I'm being biased because of my experience, I guess it goes back to, until you've walked in my shoes, then nobody really knows how easily a situation can be resolved or escalated in a moment.